folks, uh, welcome to lecture number six. I have been very guilty of keeping you long for most of the pre first lectures, and that was um, not necessarily intentional, but was necessary given the stuff that we were going over. And the idea is I like to hit you with the basic stuff and then start allowing you to figure out how it works by giving you lab assignments and things. Okay, so today's lecture is going to be a little bit. Um, a little bit faster. There's just as many slides, but we're going to be going through them fairly quickly. And what we're going to be doing today is talking about some of the things that the flume allowed us to determine, and then start talking about some of the more diagnostic uh, types of, um, of structures that we have as well. Okay. Now, what we did last time, we, ta we talked about a flume. Uh, we introduced the whole idea of uh, how flume structures are going to be presented or produced. We call this traction in place structures or sedimentary structures. And then the last thing we talked about was flow <coughs> regime. And a reminder, flow regime is a convenient way of not having to worry about all the variables that are ultimately going to affect the nature of sedimentary structures. High flow regime or upper flow regime and lower flow regime allow you to more or less consider the nature of structures that are happening at different energy regimes. Uh, we introduced, or I guess we didn't introduce this, but we again summarized the whole idea of what bed load is, and this is what was important for understanding how flumes work. It's the bed load component that our flume is going to be looking at. Uh, we have saltation, rolling, and sliding. We talked about the various types of sedimentary structures, and these are called primary sedimentary structures because they are associated with currents. How they formed in increasing water velocity under ideal conditions in a flume. Uh, it goes from planned lamination, the lower variety, through small current ripples, through to large current ripples. And uh, I mentioned just briefly that it's probably not a good idea to refer to these as dunes, even though we still do. All us old timers still call them dunes. Uh, mega ripples is, uh, is preferred, as is large current ripples. Then upper planned lamination, followed by anti dunes. And of course, once you get beyond the threshold of anti dunes, you're in a situation where you're no longer moving the sediment by traction. Instead, what happens is everything gets blasted out and you go from bed load into suspended load. Try where possible to link these concepts with some of the things we've talked about previously. For example, the lecture before this one, we were talking about flow regime and those diagrams I gave you that talked about how sediment moves at different rates at different conditions. Well, if you were to think of this scheme applied to some of those diagrams, this is one of those diagrams where you start going beyond the threshold of traction into essentially suspension. I gave you a whole bunch of diagrams. This was probably the worst of them. That gave you morphology and terminology. And yeah, every once in a while, it's nice to actually look at something that an engineer has designed. <laughs> Looks pretty. I mean, you know, I'm surprised that someone actually hasn't started doing Lexus commercials or maybe something from Ford saying how we designed our cars to be a small current ripple. Be All right. <laughs> they have archers. I mean, talk about stupid commercials. We designed our car because of an archer. And then they have this, well, I don't know what it is. It's, some it's, a, Cadillac. it's a Cadillac. Is it a Cadillac? All right, so the Cadillac is running. They're shooting arrows at it. And I guess the idea is that the Cadillac's so fast that air archers can't shoot it and all. But it's kind of a dumb concept if you think about it. This is better. We also talked about the idea of how ripples migrate downstream. And, and I, I told you the first time I had a video I wasn't going to show you, but then I thought about it afterwards. I think I'm going to show it to you anyway. Okay, so here's the idea is that over time the ripples are going to migrate downstream. All right? The best way of illustrating this is to look at a flume. Now, the reason why I didn't want to show you this at first is this is really pixelated because the actual image is about like this big. And I blew it up as much as I could and still give you an opportunity to see how this works. Okay? Now, what you're going to be looking at is a bird's eye view looking down on a flume and this is a series of over 1100 separate images that are all put together into movie format. It's fuzzy and pixelated because as I said you have to imagine it looking like this big to start with. Now the currents can be going this direction. The light areas you see here are the lee side of ripples. The dark areas are the stoss side of ripples and I'm just going to click this and you should see it moving around here and whoa! That's not how that's supposed to happen. There we go. All right, and you see how over time they simply migrate downstream. And again, you got to remember these are the grains bouncing off the backside, being deposited and added to the lee side of the ripples, and being removed from the stoss side of the ripples. And clearly, these are not what I would call straight crested ripples. They're rather lingoidal in nature. Okay, so that's how the sand moves from one point to another. Um, we also talked about the idea of this that. 
over time what will happen is if you have net deposition, net accretion, then what will happen is each successive passing of an additional ripple will remove but not completely the previous ones, giving rise to the so-called um, cross lamination and these are called ripple cross laminae because they are ripple scaled and if they look like they're kind of tiny they are but they are oh so ever important when you get to field camp you will pass through some rocks that are sedimentary in nature that are composed of fairly large ripple cosets you will be able to look at those rocks and even though they are tilted virtually vertically, or in some cases upside down, you will be able to determine which way is up. Ripples, mega ripples, anything that has a coset structure to it has the potential for you being used as a way up indicator because of this. The top of a ripple tends to have a higher angle from here to there, and that, that angle is about 34 degrees, than the bottom, in part because of that bypass fraction that eddy spins back here. So you end up tending to get a tailing off of the ripple in this direction. So the angle where the ripple meets the depositional surface eventually migrates to about zero degrees. That always gives you this very obvious change in angle. So it doesn't matter if the rocks are tilted vertically or upside down. If you can find the difference between that sharp angle, that high angle, and that low angle, you always know the way up is in that direction. And if you want to impress David Allison, when you were out in the field and you come across one of these things, look at it, consider what it is, and then say, Dr. Allison, this is the way up, right? And he's going to look at you and go, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's really good, you know, um, I, I think it deserves a beer. Yes. Because yeah, so, he will. We talked about the different patterns of ripples too, okay? And uh, the ones we saw in the movie were more like this shape, lingoidal. The straight crustal ones tend to form under lower flow regimes. And as you get to higher flow regimes, it goes from straight to sinuous to lingoidal and ultimately to lunate. And I'll show you some lunate ripples shortly too, okay? And then lastly, this was the diagram that illustrates all these structures together. Now this was key stuff. This was important stuff because ultimately, looking at how a flume works tells you what the conditions were like when you find these various structures in the rock record. Now here's what today's lecture, I know there's a lot of stuff here, but I'm going to go through these slides fairly quickly because a lot of them are just pictures. We've talked about how flumes work, now let's start talking about what the structures actually look like in the real world. So we're going to be looking at some models, we're going to be talking very quickly about the idea of transport versus aggregation, we're going to introduce different types of sedimentary structures, wave ripples, erosional features, surface features, intrusive features, and then some really diagnostic structures as well. Now you should be aware and this is true of every interpretation in every discipline in geology and probably in every discipline there is. You never look at one piece of evidence as solving the crime. You always take into account all the pieces of evidence that are there. Now in geology, of course, we don't talk about evidence, we talk about data. So if you are at a sedimentary outcrop and you're looking at things, you record all the information you can on that. You look at the information afterwards and think about what the sum of all those data are telling you before you make any determinations. The difference between a good geologist and a bad, sorry, the difference between a good sedimentologist and a bad sedimentologist is one who does not come up with a spontaneous explanation for things after looking at one grain of sand. If you're clever, what you'll say is, let me look at it, let me get back to you. Oh, and by the way, I charge $250 an hour, and it'll probably take me a couple hours to look at this. That's a clever sedimentologist. Also one who's got enough money to buy beer whenever somebody finds interesting sedimentary structures in the outcrops. All right? However, there are times where you do find one clue that is the smoking gun in geology. I'll show you a couple of those today as well, okay? All right, let's talk about these things. Um, I, we talked about small current ripples. These are small current ripples. Um, this is uh, scans right out of a, <coughs> pardon me, right out of a textbook. I'm sorry, you're going to see some kind of um, read through or bleed through in the scanning images. Uh, these are small current ripples. These are relatively straight crested ripples. In this case, the shadow is the lee side. The light side is the stoss side. Anybody care to speculate which direction the current was going in this picture? 
Yeah, left to right, same as what this picture is in through here. In fact, this is actually a blow up of that area as well, okay? So clearly, this is the avalanche side and away you go. So these are what straight crested small current ripples look like. Yeah? Oh, you tell me, what do you think? Could be arid, but those things are kind of flat. Now, the wave, the uh, the wave index or the ripple index could tell you something about what this environment was. But if you look, they're fairly flat and have very steep components to it. That normally means water. But where would you expect to see something this broad exposed? A tidal flat at low tide is one very good possibility. In fact, Ryan can sing our our classic tidal flat specialist. But it's also possible it's a beach, because when the high tides come in. You know, we talk about the idea of beach surf zone and stuff, but you often get very shallow pools where the currents will swing around. Yes. I've seen this in Dolphin Island, for example. Shallow bay. Shallow bay or something like that. But anyway, you want to look at it, it's going to be some place where the water's drawn out now because it's not there now. So good observations. Uh, here's uh, some additional ripples. These are nice straight crested ripples in through here. These are a little bit more symmetrical. And this is something we're talking about a little bit later on. But symmetrical ripples normally mean there's a certain amount of wave influence. And uh, that probably means that these are, again, on the surf zone of a, uh, a, 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 by a beach or exposed part of a beach. Ripple crest, yep. These are some models. And uh, there's all sorts of programs that are available for you to play around with this as to see how things work and all. And sometimes just the sketches themselves are rather instructive. So what we're looking at here is a model of small current ripples. Notice the cosets, they kind of cut through each other here a little bit. That's typical when you have more lunate ripples and all. <clears throat> the thing to note is that we're talking about three-dimensional structures. So far we've been talking about everything in the two dimensions, how things migrate downstream. But you also have to remember that there's going to be a third dimension. So block diagrams like this are very instructive in showing you how things would look on the surface, on the side, and also in the third dimension, in the dimension looking towards you. That's a key thing. For small current ripples, it's very hard to see this because the laminations are so fine and there's really not much left of the cosets. But here, and, and again, this is a bad scan, but here you can see the cross stratification, the cross lamination. Here, it's largely parallel. And the reason for this is that the avalanche is coming towards your direction. You'll get the occasional wisps that are cut out, giving you these little convex shapes to things. But for the most part, it's parallel lamination in the direction that you are looking at if the current's coming towards you. Which is one of the reasons why, if you see a good sedimentologist, when they go to the outcrop, they're not just looking at what the outcrop is showing in this direction, they're trying to look around the side of it, which is kind of hard if it's a flat cliff in front of you. So what you'll see sedimentologists doing is getting their hammers in and start pounding the hell of the outcrop. What they're doing is they're digging a trench, and then they'll look sideways like that. Because you might actually see parallel laminations at you, and then when you look in the opposite direction, you'll see that those parallel laminations are associated with four sets that are all tilted in this direction. So every opportunity you have, Start digging at the oak crop and looking at it in three different directions or three different dimensions. Uh, here's another one. I'm just showing you a couple models. There's the actual things as they look like on the surface. Uh, um, that's a Leatherman for scale. That's the direction of currents. And this is what the things would look like in three dimensions as well as in the different directions. Now notice this shape here. The reason for this is that when you start having lunate ripples or lingoidal ripples, you start instead of having cr straight crests, you start having little scours associated with each of the ripples. And that result is, in this direction, you start seeing these little troughs. In fact, that goes by a very important name called trough cross bedding. And this is the one time that you can use the term trough cross bedding because we are talking about bedded structures. This is a structure that's also very uh, common in large current ripples as well. I have seen outcrops, for example, that are clearly a channel from a meandering river, a big river from the, sounds, from the looks of it as well, where what you see in the direction you're looking at are nothing but these huge troughs. If you were to dig out that trench and look at it in the third dimension, you see these beautiful planar cross stratification units in them as well. Well, okay, so that's another thing to consider. These are the lunate ripples. I didn't show you a picture of these things before because uh, it wasn't in the diagram I showed you, but lunate ripples tend to be something that form under the highest uh, regimes before you pass into another sedimentary structure, and they give you these beautiful crescent-shaped things. And again, in cross-section, they look exactly the same. So you really can't tell the difference between a lunate ripple and a lingoidal ripple unless the ripples are still preserved in the, uh, in the rocks. 
Uh, some large current ripples. And again, these are interesting because what happens here is you often get things forming on the backs of others. This is uh, this diagram just shows you what they look like. But this one's kind of cool here because what you got is a very large current ripple with small little lunate ripples on top of them. And again, you have to realize that when you're talking about big bed forms, like the things that might form in a tidal channel in a stream somewhere, these things might be 15 feet high. So at the bottom of these large ripples, the depositional conditions are different than at the top. This is what I tried to talk to you about in the whole idea of these composite dune structures. Well, that's what this is, is a composite structure. So we're only looking at something that's relatively small, although the scale here is a meter. These things can get huge in size. And as long as you understand the dynamics of how one forms, you understand how the dynamics of them all form, except that you need deeper water in order for this to work. I want to show you this too because um, it, it, let me go back here, just one diagram. Because you know we're looking at these wonderful diagrams showing these beautiful three-dimensional structures. If you're standing in a beach or a tidal channel, you'll see them because they formed on the surface. But you got to remember, deposition works by putting layers on top of other layers. Each successive passage of a ripple is going to obliterate most of the ripple that was deposited before it. Net result is, over time, you're going to literally have a flat depositional surface original law of horizontality rules apply here. And then something else will change. So it's more likely that you're going to get mud deposited on top of a flat sandstone than you are going to get mud deposited on a sandstone with mega ripples like this on top of it. Net result is the tops of most sandstones look like this or this because the tops have been completely planed off. This is what trough cross bedding looks like if you take the top surface off and plane it off entirely. Now this is one of those difficult things to visualize unless you can actually see it happening. So if all goes as planned, I'll be able to show you it actually happening. This is one of those computer animation model thingies. Okay, So what this is going to show you is how a mega ripple migrates, builds up over time, and then what happens when you erode the top of it off. Okay, So click to start. All right, here we go. So migrating. Going over time, adding stuff. Eventually it's going to stop. Erode it down, giving you that tr planar trough stuff, and that morphs into what it actually looks like in the rocks. All right, now this is an important structure because if you have this exposed at the surface of the Earth, and if you understand the night type of ripple that you were dealing with, it's actually instructive as a paleo current indicator because troughs start narrow and open up to get wider. In this case, the current went that way. So you can stand on top of these things with your button compass and go like this and go like, current was going east to west, or north to south, or bearing at 45 degrees. Kind of cool stuff if you find it. So surface features may not look exactly like the original, but you can still interpret them if you know what it is you're dealing with. Okay. Yeah. However, we're going to talk about migration versus aggregation now. We already know what migration is. The idea is that as time goes on, sediment is going to migrate from one place to another. So this is the difference in terms of orientation of things. Current going that direction, sediment will migrate in the direction of current, and over time will start to aggrade in this direction. Now, aggradation only will take place if you're getting net accumulation of sediment. This is important. And most depositional surfaces, when you see sand being deposited on, it's a temporary thing because the sand will get removed the next event that comes along that washed it there in the first place. Net deposition of sediment will only occur if you've got something happening with your overall accommodation space. If you happen to have different rates of sediment being brought into a system versus migration, something interesting can happen. All right. This is called a climbing ripple situation. And when this occurs, you have more sediment coming in. It's aggregating faster than it is migrating. What will happen is you'll start to have ripples that are migrating down current, but others will start to migrate on top of them before the others have had a chance to migrate entirely away. If it's net deposition taking place here, it's possible for you to change the nature of the depositional surface. It goes from being horizontal to one that is inclined. Okay, So these are called climbing ripples. There's the horizon. That's the depositional surface we normally would deal with. This is the depositional surface that we get when we have an abundance of sediment coming in. And the difference between them is called the climb angle. Climbing ripples are important. 
Because if you see climbing ripples, what it tells you is sediment was coming in incredibly rapidly. Now, there's very few situations where sediment's going to be coming in like crazy. You can't just simply add more sand coming in from a river, if you think about it, because the sand coming in from the river is controlled by the current itself. You'd have to add something to the sediment normally coming in from the river. I've seen climbing ripples in two situations. One situation was in an area that was being subjected to airfall tephras, in other words, pumice. Little particles of pumice were falling into an embayment. And obviously, if you've got a current moving with new stuff falling in on top, you're going to have such rapid sedimentation, you'll get climbing ripples there. That indicates rapid sedimentation. I also saw climbing ripples like this when I was on a trip to Namibia associated with the snowball earth hypothesis. Okay? We found some stuff. We were shown stuff. I didn't find any of this. I was on a tour. All right? And the person who was responsible for this whole idea showed us places where there were climbing ripples. And his argument was, this indicates very rapid sedimentation. The weird thing was, the climbing ripples were associated with fine carbonate sediment. And this, of course, has something to do with the whole snowball earth hypothesis. All right? And it was an important thing to consider. I'll tell you about that later on when we have a chance. Let's talk about wave ripples now, just briefly, okay? We've been talking about current ripples. Wave ripples are those that are associated with so-called orbicular flow. What is orbicular flow, you ask? Orbicular flow occurs when you have got water that is thrown up in a sinuous form like so. It is almost always associated with wind. And what will happen here is that the wind more or less pushes the upper part of the water. This is kind of like a shear related phenomenon. The essential effect is that a water molecule at the top of the crest will feel a motion that is more or less circular. Now the motion is best illustrated by me showing you how it works. Okay, So imagine I'm floating in the water at the top of the crest. As the crest is moving from my left to my right, it will come over me and it will push me in this direction, but as the crest, crest goes by, it's going to drop me down elevation-wise, then I'm going to be drawn up in the trough of the crest of the next wave like this. Okay, So net orbicular motion involves this type of orbital motion in one place. By the way, had I started it's a little bit better. Had I started in the trough here, the sense of motion would have been exactly the same, except I would have been drawn up before I was brought down again. All right. As you go deeper and deeper and deeper, the sense of the orbitals is going to get smaller because, frankly, if it's wind-driven, it's a surface issue, so the deeper you go, the less influence you're going to see, and eventually what will happen is you'll pass through an area where there's no motion. This, of course, is called the wave base. The thing is, if you've got the waves hitting the bottom of the water, any sediment that is down here is going to feel a push from one way and then a push from the other direction. So you get this back and forth motion. That's how these orbitals are translated into a flat surface. You get shear going back and forth. Like, it feels like I'm doing an Egyptian dance here. Which is appropriate since I'm doing a pharaoh as one of my projects in my art course this year. That result is you're going to get sediment being thrown up into symmetrical ripples. And that's what you get here. Okay. Now notice you can still have cross uh, laminations associated with this, but that it will be going in opposite directions. You get built up structures that look kind of like this or like this. And it is possible to have a residual current. For example, the orbitals don't have to just do this. They can do this where you go back and forth like so. And this will give you a net migration of sediment in one direction as well. Wave ripples usually are associated with marine environments or lacustrine environments, lakes, etc. But they can be associated with parts of fluvial environments too. When you have, say, a flat area around a floodplain that gets flooded, if the current is more or less bringing water into an area where it gets stagnant and the winds get to it, you can start having little small uh, wave ripples in those areas as well. Um, and then again, this shows you how cross stratification of wave ripples shows you how they aggregate over time as well. Okay? So all these things are variables that you have to be aware of whenever you see a sedimentary structure in the rocks. Let's talk about some erosional structures now. We've been talking about deposition. Now it's time to start talking about what happens when things get eroded away. This is a structure that we've talked about already. These are rip-up class. Now what you're looking at here is a beautiful uh, lithic sandstone. 
from Australia. This is a chunk of black shale and these are fragments of black shale within the sand. If you see fragments of shale within the sand, it tells you two things. Number one, that somewhere at the time the sand was being deposited, there was a layer of mud that was also being deposited. Makes sense, right? If you're going to get the stuff incorporated in the sand, there had to have been some mud around it. Not this stuff, that's above it, but the idea is that these two things imply that there were similar environments side by side. It also tells you that there was a pretty strong current because in order to get a rip up class, you have to have mud being exposed somewhere that is subjected to currents that are such that it will break the mud up into small bits. But you know, mud's composed of silt and clay. And didn't we say earlier that the finer the particles, the slower the currents are that have to move them? So, anybody care to speculate how rip up class can occur at all? Josh. Area dries out and then floods again, currents fast and proofs up the chunks of dry clay. But why wouldn't the clay get washed away at lower currents? Why? All right. Remember Yolstrom's diagram. Remember that tail, where the clay particles end up potentially requiring stronger currents to move than the sands do because of that coherent relationship between the clay particles. All right. So there's a perfect example that what you've got here now is a situation where that has occurred. By the way, this is a fairly common uh, sedimentary structure in areas that are periodically exposed. Um, to um, the atmosphere. Tidal flats, for example, are very common where you see this. So this is sometimes associated with tidal flat conditions. Other types of sedimentary structures we have, um, I don't have pictures of these things because sometimes it's more instructive just to more or less draw you cartoon on the chalkboard or describe it to you. If you've got deposition normally taking place like this where you get a nice series of layers of sediment, and this is the current now, if for whatever reason the conditions get really intense, you go from an interval where anti-dunes might form into an interval where you get erosion taking place. That result is you're going to have the potential for an erosive event and then next time you have sand coming in it gets deposited like this. These are called scours. Scours are kind of like a small version of an unconformity in that there is a loss of material but it is not considered an unconformity because the scouring is part of the whole depositional process. It's not unusual incidentally to see sedimentary sequences where there are a whole bunch of different scours at different levels because of changing current regimes. Channels, channels are just big scours. A river like the Mississippi or the Mobile River system that is migrating over an area is going to be eroding at its base and depositing behind it. If something should happen that that system changed, what you'd find is that you'd have a bottom part filled with sand associated with the point bar migrating with new stuff on top of it. You get a real long scour surface. Sometimes channels are easily identified in the rocks. In fact, I've, I've seen channels that literally look like this. We have sand and then surrounding it on all sides are other things like mud. So that is a remnant channel that pinches over at that point. So this channel changed its path and was overlain by additional materials, probably floodplain deposits and things. Flute marks. Now these are kind of difficult to actually explain. They're, they're more of a, of a physics or an engineering phenomenon, but they do find their presence in the rocks and they are important things to note. Imagine now you're on a beach. You have a couple shells that are sitting on the beach. The uh, tide or the uh, swash comes in, the water comes flying in this direction, all right, and then recedes back in that direction. So the actual current is strongest in this direction and then goes back in that direction, okay? What happens is the presence of some sort of a hard or large barrier causes the currents to be deflected from going streaming in this case down around the object so you get this little trough on the outside of it and then on the back side you get this very characteristic V-shape, almost like a little depositional surface. The details of it look like this. Okay? I, can, I, mean, I can tell you it's got to be something that's fairly important if you see somebody who's doing a diagram showing the physics and the morphology of things. The interesting thing about this is these structures are found in sedimentary rocks. 
but not at the tops of rock units. They're always found at the base. Because what will happen is, the next time something is deposited on top of this, it will fill in the hole that's here and leave you a small, little, obvious bump on the bottom. So, this is why if you see a good sedimentologist in the field, and if you happen to see some good rocks in the field, so for example, you're going up a cliff like this, and there's a couple bedding planes that are exposed like that, often you'll see sedimentologists looking on the undersides of beds, because you might actually see on the underside this little bump associated with that type of structure. And again, it's important because it tells you that was the net flow direction, or that was the flow direction in the rocks. Okay, so flute marks, really important things. That's the under bed view of what they look like. Okay, so this is looking at the underside of a bedding plane, showing you the direction of flow was in this direction. So here you can see it's a little bit deeper there and tends to flatten out in that direction. Um, those of you that are in paleontology or enjoy paleontology will also know that in sedimentary rocks, or during sediment, there's an awful lot of beasties that live and they will leave behind evidence of their presence. So you're going to see both marks by organisms and marks by other types of things. This is not a mark by an organism, although it looks very much like what might have been left behind by a trilobite. Instead, what this is, is the bottom side view of uh, probably something like a stick dragging along the bottom of a stream. And as it goes, it kind of leaves these little impact marks. So this is the current direction, like so, showing you how it all works. Um, oops. You know, I probably should have talked about the beasties right now, but of course I didn't do that. Some surface features. Uh, some of these things are not going to last very long. Uh, raindrop imprints. If you were out with me when we were in municipal, I forget which group it was, but we were at municipal park um, when we were getting samples and I came across some place with the little raindrop imprints in the sediment and I almost started getting excited and showing people what they look like. Uh, raindrop imprints occur when you have a surface exposed, rain hits it obviously, leaving little crater impact sites like so. The odds of these things ever being preserved in the rock record are incredibly rare, but nevertheless we do find them from time to time, so these are some Triassic age raindrop imprints and what would have been a kind of probably a soft mud at the time. And if you think about it, it makes sense that it would be rare. Number one, the odds of this stuff surviving as the next depositional component was on top of it is rare, but also you'd have to have conditions where the mud was wet that it starts to rain a little bit, but then stops. Because if it were going to rain heavily, of course, there wouldn't be any raindrops left on it. So they are rare things. <clears throat> what isn't rare are mud cracks. Mud cracks are inherently important structures. These are modern mud cracks. These are ancient mud cracks. Notice again, they all are characterized by these ternary breakup patterns. If you had me for Geology 112, you know I go into a lot of detail about the importance of ternary patterns in the breakup of things. And this is clear evidence that it does occur that way and also that they can be preserved in the rock record. And of course, if you find mud cracks in an ancient depositional sequence, what does it tell you must have happened? Yeah, wet mud dried out. And the only way you're going to dry it out in this fashion is if you expose it to sunshine. If you expose it to sunshine, that means you're in an area where water eventually was removed, either in a floodplain that was flooded or in a tidal flat or something like that. And I told you about the beastie trails and uh, here's some that are surface ones. Most beastie trails are going to be either surface or vertical, okay? So these are kind of like the opposite to what you would have had in terms of the tool marks on the underside. Um, they can often be preserved, in fact they are usually preserved in some fashion if they were there at all. Parting lineations, I, I'm not going to go into much detail about this one, but I'm going to get excited if we get to Moscow Landing and the conditions are good this year. Parting lineations are weird. They're associated with streaming or upper flow regime plan bedding, or if you wish, upper plan bedding. It occurs when water comes surging inwards and then returns back in the same direction. You end up getting these little parallel lineations. What they are are just kind of like straight grooves that are aligned parallel to the swash and return direction. You can find them on beaches very easily. Occasionally you'll see them preserved in sedimentary rocks, but it's rare. 
because you have to have a very well exposed bedding plane surface view of it. Remember that though when we get to Moscow Landing because there is one place where you can see these if you get your eye into them. And you know where it is when you get there because it's about the only place where you can stand on top of a very flat sandstone bed. Now intrusive structures, these are kind of cool. Um, Intrusive structures are those things that either go from the surface downwards or go from the base upwards. In other words, they cut through rocks. The first of these things are called load structures. Load structures occur where you have sand sitting on top of very wet mud. Now the transitions going from mud to sand are not that unusual if you think about it, right? You could have a nice little area which is an estuary or an embayment just had nice fresh mud being deposited with the last tidal cycle and then in comes a storm of sand. The sand comes out, it's heavy, the mud is still wet, so the sand starts to sink down into the mud. Similar things can happen in rivers, a whole bunch of different places. What happens here is that the weight of the sand is such that it starts to sink itself down and can eventually detach itself and sink exactly like a chunk of lithosphere sinking into the mantle of the earth giving you these so-called ball and pillow type structures, okay? So that's load structures that are taking place there. Ball and pillows are when they detach and look like this, but it's the same type of phenomenon, okay? Then you can have just the opposite, sand dikes. A sand dike occurs under the situations, pretty much like we've been talking about, where you have very rapid sedimentation and a transition. So what will happen is you'll have some sand that's being deposited, and then there'll be additional material deposited on top, okay, very quickly. In this case, you're looking at mud being deposited on top of sand. If there isn't enough time for the sand to dewater, and over time what will happen is the sand grains will eventually start to get packed down and the water tends to move out. In most normal situations, that takes place as deposition is taking place. That takes place as deposition, we get the idea, right? It takes place simultaneously with additional deposition. But if you go too quickly, what happens is you have a situation where you have high water pressure in the sand and then you start having a downward load on top of the sand. Eventually what happens is it causes the sand to dewater quickly. The dewatering might result in a sudden burst of sand upwards through the mud. The term sand dikes obviously is because these things are similar to what happens with basalt dikes or dye based dikes or anything that happens in an igneous situation. Except here it's being driven by dewatering mechanisms. So you end up seeing these things coming across all over the place. Now the reason why these dikes are important to mention now is, again, when you go to Moscow Landing, if the conditions are favorable for this this year, I will take you to a place where there are sand dikes and breccia dikes cutting across all manner of stuff. Clearly, something must have happened to dewater the material below and force it to inject upwards at great velocity. And that's something worth considering. Mud volcanoes. Mud volcanoes occur in the same situation, except now what happens is you have a bunch of wet mud down here. If the pressures are such, the mud will start to bubble its way up towards the surface, but it's liquefied because it's mud, and it will make it up to the surface where it will bubble out to give you this wonderful mud volcano like so. Mud volcanoes have been in the news recently. A couple years ago, there was a village in, I want to say somewhere in Indonesia, that was buried by a mud volcano. It's very fluid, so once it starts to flow, it can cover very large areas. I mean, this one is on the order of, what, three meters? So that's 10 feet across, so 20 feet across. The mud volcano that buried Indonesia, this village, was several hundred meters across and several tens of meters high. They blamed it ultimately on drilling activity associated with an oil company down there. Now whether or not it was the oil company that did it or not, the idea was that someone more or less disturbed the subsurface and caused the stuff to make it up to the surface and just kept going. Um, I heard of one in New Zealand. This happened a couple of years before I started doing my field work in New Zealand. And it was um, in an area where you'd expect it to happen because New Zealand at this time had horrendous sedimentation being dumped very quickly. This mud volcano appeared in someone's backyard and was pouring mud out like crazy for many days. 
The problem was that it was coming from quite deep down, several, I want to say several thousand feet, so maybe what, 500 meters or so. It was hot because it was quite deep down. It had a lot of methane gas in it. So imagine this thing kind of bubbling away. It was probably like 20, 30 degrees Celsius hotter than the surrounding temperature at the time. So it's steaming away and it smells like someone had a big dump somewhere. It looked like someone had a big dump somewhere and it wouldn't stop. It just kept going until it, the pressure had been alleviated and all. And then of course when it stopped, you can go back and do your own thing. And then there's these. Um, I'm going to let you take a look at these things for a second. I'm going to explain how the name Monroe's came about. Okay? These are real sedimentary structures, so I don't want to hear anybody start talking about sexual harassment or anything like that. They're called Monroe's, and they're associated again with a dewatering type of structure. They occur in areas where you're in a muddy environment where there's also localized freezing. Now, it's not something we would expect to see down here because while it might get cold, we never get to the point where the ground starts to freeze here. But if you happen to be in some place like the tidal flats of Europe, Canada, or anywhere where it's cold enough, what will happen is the water below the tidal flat will start to freeze. As it freezes, it expands. When it starts to melt, the water now starts to be released and you're in a situation now where you have a lot of water suddenly appearing, it starts to escape up to the surface and brings fine mud with it and it comes out and gives you these things. And the person who named these things called them Monroe's because at the time Marilyn Monroe was quite popular for reasons that we don't have to go into detail about, okay? Alright, let's look at some really diagnostic sedimentary structures very quickly and then we'll call it quits for today, okay? Let's talk about beach environments first of all. And I'm going to come back and talk about these when we get to the actual environments later on, alright? But I just want to give you an idea what the sedimentary structures are since we're talking about sedimentary structures now. When you are in a beach environment, you have water washing in and washing backwards. This is the swash zone, okay? This is the area where this process is taking place back and forth. The surface is flat because you are in an upper flow regime environment. The water coming in is surging fast enough that it's high velocity. When it reverses itself and goes back, it starts off slow but picks up steam again before the next cycle comes in, okay? So within this swash zone of a beach, you're going to have a flat depositional surface. But it's not entirely flat. It's got a tilt on it because you're going from the top of the beach that's exposed above sea level to the bottom of the beach where it's below sea level. The actual inclination ranges from about 3 degrees to maybe 10 degrees. So it's very shallow. You really can't see it unless you actually try to measure it very accurately. The thing to note is that you have a flat depositional surface, but you also have cuspate erosional or scour surface on this. Any of you that have ever gone walking along the beach, you know, if you've got this really nice profile, you'll see the beach has a bit of a bend to it, and then you'll see little places where there's little cuts, little swashes where you can see a little pulse of water coming up and then washing back. So the net result is, what happens is every successive pulse of water coming through scours out a very shallow trough, all right, bringing sand back with it, and then another one will come through and the trough might be moved a little bit. Net result is you get these so-called low angle cross stratification levels because that's where the scour is cutting through the flat depositional surface. To the best of my knowledge, this type of structure will only occur in an environment where you have this swash return. So right at the beach. This is considered to be a beach diagnostic structure. So if you see low angle cross stratification, it looks like this then you know you're dealing with something that is pretty darn close to a beach. And of course, then what you do is you look for other information that will more or less convince you of that. And by the way, this is where they're trying to show you the little kind of erosional swashes that are cut through. Muddy tidal environments are characterized by situations where you have a reverse of currents as well as a change in flow regime. In order to understand this, imagine now you live in a place where the tides are sufficient to bring water in and then turn around and go back. This is not our area. We do not have good tides in this region. But if you lived on the east coast of North America or on the west coast of Europe, what you would see is every day, once or twice, the tide's coming in. And when they're coming in, the water's moving in fairly quickly. They'll get to a maximum. They will stop. After the tidal cycle goes by, the water will return and go back in the opposite direction. So what you end up having is a situation where water is coming in, moving sand with it. 
When it gets to the point where it's reached its maximum inundation, it stops. There's a period of time that the water just sits there and then it reverses itself. During the time that the water is sitting there, you normally have muds raining down, especially if there's a lot of flocculation. When the cycle reverses itself, it will be moving sand again, but in the opposite direction. Net result is you get these really cool types of tidal bedding. There are three types that are here, depending upon the ratio of mud to sand. If you are in the middle part of the tidal cycle, where you literally are having sand moving back and forth, what you end up getting are little small current ripples, where the ripples will be showing in different directions of orientation because of the currents going different ways, with little mud drapes periodically put on top of them. If, however, you're on the muddy end of the estuary, it will be more like this, where you have more mud with little trapped ripples in between them. And then if you're kind of midway between those two, you'll have this. Now, of course, it's not just necessarily position. It also has to do with the nature of the sediment coming in, tidal rates, etc. But geologists recognized that there was going to be this end member sequence of mud to sand tidal lights, as they're called, depending upon where you are. Sand dominated tidal lights are called flazer bedding. Mud dominated tidal lights are called lenticular bedding. And those that are halfway in between are called wavy bedding. Again, to the best of my knowledge, if you ever see this type of material, you know you're on a tidal flat somewhere and you're subjected to big tides. Again, very, very diagnostic. Sandy tidal environments, very quickly. If it's all sand, then what you would expect to see is a structure that's mostly sand, but here we end up getting cross stratification going in two different directions. And incidentally, this so-called herringbone cross stratification, because it looks like the bones of a fish, they say, is associated with strong currents going this way, making the four sets going like so, and then when the currents reverse themselves, they take the sand and move it back in the opposite direction. You can plot these data up on various diagrams and you'll see that there's literally 180 degree directional change. There's only one environment on the surface of the Earth where you're going to see two directions like this. That's going to be in a tidal environment. And lastly, deep marine environments. This is below wave base. Now once again, we're going to talk about this depositional, environment, uh, de depositional structure a little bit later on, but I want to show you these things now so you can understand why they're so significant. Turbidites, which you would have encountered in Geology 111 and which are associated with the whole mass flow uh, process I told you about later on, are associated with deep water environments where you have an underwater landslide. Net result is you get a series of these beds which have sand and mud in them. The operating or the characteristic thing that makes these things unique is that they are finding upward cycles. All right, so when you see turbidites, you know you're in a deep water environment of some sort. And this one is or was an incredibly diagnostic structure that will require a significant amount of explanation when we have a chance to get to this. This is called hair, uh, hummocky cross stratification, otherwise short form to HCS. That's what it looks like in the rocks. This is what it looks like in terms of modeling. What it is, is a really weird structure that is mostly parallel lamination, but with an upward kind of domal shape to it. Very, very subtle. It's very hard to see this unless you know what you're looking for. It's called cross stratification because there are very subtle cuts and they cross through each other. So the lamination is cut through. If you're not careful, you can sometimes confuse this with parallel lamination more rarely as low angle cross stratification. But it's the hummocky thing that's most important. It's believed that this is a structure that is formed under primarily lower plan conditions, but where there is an overriding orbicular motion to it. So in other words, imagine you're sitting down in an environment where it's mostly quiet, but there's kind of like this type of oscillation affecting things like this. All right? What it does is it brings the sediment up and causes it to be deposited in this layering and all. It is normally associated with incredibly deep water situations. In some cases, hummocky cross stratification has been found in water that's believed to be 150 to 200 meters water depth. That is below the shelf. If it is associated with waves and orbicular motion as it seems to be, 
What does that tell you about the nature of the waves that are necessary in order to actually make this type of structure? Yeah. If you remember, you know, basic laws of waves, that the wavelength is related to the fair weather wave base or the wave base, that the deeper you go, the bigger the wavelength has to be. And I think the relationship is L over 2. So if you have 250, so if you have 200 meters of water, you have to have 400 meter wavelengths. And if you have 400 meter wavelengths, then the nature of the waves is also pretty darn big. In fact, the only thing that we can think of to form something like this that can give us waves this big is a pretty strong wind, probably associated with cyclones or hurricanes. So Hamaki cross stratification has been earmarked as a storm indicator. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on too when we have a chance because it's, uh, uh, it's an important structure in terms of where it appears in the stratigraphic record. All right, now with that, I'm getting better. Just went long by five minutes this time. Um, with that, uh, we'll call it quits for today. Here's your homework. You got your data plot.